Chapter 13, The Spinal Cord, Spinal Nerves, and Reflexes. So we'll start first with the gross anatomy of the spinal cord. It's about 18 inches long, or 45 centimeters, half an inch wide, and ends between vertebrae L1 and L2, or the lumbar section. It exhibits bilateral symmetry, meaning same on both sides mirror image. There are grooves that divide the spinal cord into left and right sides. And we have on the posterior side, the posterior median sulcus. And on the anterior side, a deep groove called the anterior median fissure. So let's see if I can show you that quickly. Okay, so here we can see the spinal cord, or excuse me, the brain, and then the spinal cord coming down. And over here, we can see the spinal cord continuing down through the thoracic section of the spine. So if we were to take a cross section from the spinal cord and blow it up, that's what we see right here, okay? And you can see that the spinal cord kind of has a butterfly pattern on the inside of gray matter and white matter that surrounds the gray matter. Remember, gray matter is the unmyelinated axons that we can that are accumulating together, and then the white matter are the myelinated neurons. And there's a large amount of myelin, myelinated neurons. On the posterior side of the spinal cord, we have a little indentation there called the posterior median sulcus. On the anterior side, we have a deep groove called the anterior median fissure. Okay, The distal or distant end of the spinal cord, um, we have the conus medullaris, which is thin, conical, and found below the lumbar enlargement. The filum terminale, which is thin, thread-like, and that is at the end of the conus medullaris. It attaches to the cockajeal ligament. And then the con cauda equina, or horsetail, is made up of nerve roots that are found below the conus medullaris. Okay, so let's see if I can show you that. So here we have the conus medullaris. We can see the cauda equina, and you can see kind of how that looks like a horse tail. And then down at the very tip, the felum terminal, okay, that attaches to the cockajeal or tailbone ligament. There are 31 spinal cord segments based on the vertebrae where the spinal nerves originate. And roots, there are two branches of spinal nerves. We have the ventral root, which contains the axon, the motor neurons, motor neurons being the ones that are carrying out an action. And the dorsal root contains axons of sensory neurons. So ventral, motor, dorsal, sensory. Dorsal root ganglia, remember the ganglia contains a mass of cell bodies. The dorsal root gang ganglia is the cell bodies of the sensory neurons. Okay, so let's look at a ganglia or ganglion here. Okay, so we've got a vertebrae and we can see on the inside, the opening, we've got the spinal cord. There's the gray matter and the white matter that surrounds it. Coming out of it, we've got the spinal nerves, and you can see this enlarged area here that represents the dorsal root ganglion, okay, or an accumulation of cell bodies. The spinal nerve, so each side of the spine, we have the dorsal and ventral roots joining together to form a spinal nerve. The nerves are mixed. They carry both afferent, which means accessing, coming in, sensory information, coming into the central nervous system, and efferent, going out or exiting, 
motor fibers. Okay, so we can see the ventral and dorsal roots joining together to form a spinal nerve. Okay, so ventral and dorsal roots join together to form the spinal nerves, which remember contain mixed neurons. We have the afferent and the efferent. Okay, so the sensory and the motor are combined in the spinal nerves. The spinal meninges. Meninges are specialized membranes that are going to separate the, the spinal cord from, from its surroundings. And they're also going to help protect the spinal cord, um, carry blood supply, and are continuous with the meninges on the cranium. So meningitis would be a viral or bacterial infection of the meninges. There are three meningeal layers. We have the dura mater, which is the outer layer of the spinal cord, the arachnoid mater, which is the middle layer, and then the pia mater, which is the inner meningeal layer. Okay, so let's take a look at this from an aerial view. So here's anterior towards the chest and posterior towards the back. And we've got the spinal cord here, surrounded by the bone of the vertebrae, okay? And coming out, we have the nerves, okay? Spinal nerves coming out here. So what we're showing from outside in, this white membrane here on the other side of this fat would be the dura mater. The next membrane in is the arachnoid mater. And then touching or surrounding the spinal cord itself is the pia mater. The dura mater is very tough and it fuses with the periosteum of the occipital bone of the skull, so it's fusing with the skull and it's continuous with the cranial dura mater. Caudally, which means at the tail or tailbone, it will taper into a dense cord of collagen fibers and join the phylum terminal. Remember the phylum terminal that we pointed out before and um, will attach to the coccygeal ligament. The epidural space is the space between the dura mater and the walls of the vertebral canal contains loose connective and adipose tissue. This is where anesthesia can be injected, okay? So here is the epidural space, okay? And it's got um, fat in it, as it mentioned, okay? Epidural space. The arachnoid mater is the middle meningeal layer and it's made up of an arachnoid membrane of simple squamous epithelia. Remember simple meaning one cell layer thick and squamous being thin and flaky and irregular. So the inner layer spaces of the arachnoid mater, the subdural space is between the arachnoid mater and the dura mater. The subarachnoid space is between the arachnoid mater and pia mater and contains lots of collagen and elastin and is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so here we can see the subarachnoid space in between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater. Very noticeable there. Okay, and cerebrospinal fluid we touched on a little bit in chapter 12. Um, this is the fluid that surrounds the spinal cord in the brain, carries dissolved gases, nutrients, and waste. Um, and we know that it also provides insulation um, and shock absorption for the brain. 
a spinal tap is when we take CSF out. We withdraw it and analyze it. Spinal tap or lumbar puncture, either one. The pia mater is the innermost meningeal layer and is made up of collagen and elastin and it's stuck to the underlying neural tissue. Okay, so in this picture we're looking at a dissected um, spinal cord. So we can see the spinal cord here and that little crack in it is the anterior median fissure. And the spinal cord, remember, is covered with the pia mater directly. The arachnoid mater has been peeled back here. We can see it being reflected. White matter is superficial and contains, remember, myelinated and unmyelinated un axons. The myelinated axons is what makes the white, white matter look white. Gray matter surrounds the central canal of the spinal cord and contains cell bodies, neuroglia, and unmyelinated axons. And when we looked at the cross section and I referred to it looking sort of like a butterfly, it has gray horns or the butterfly wings. Sensory or motor nucleus location within the gray matter will determine which body part it controls. And we'll look a little bit in a few minutes at dermatomes. So the organization, organization of white matter. Um, the white matter is organized in tracts or fasciculi. Um, and white columns contain bundles of axons and relay the same information in the same direction. So the ascending tracts are going to carry information to the brain and the descending tracts carry motor commands to the spinal cord itself. Okay, so we can see a cross section here at the end of the spinal cord and we can see the gray matter. Here are the horns, projections, and all of this would be the white matter divided into columns. We see again our anterior median fissure there and our posterior median sulcus. And coming out of the spinal cord, we have our ventral and dorsal roots, which join together to make spinal nerves that will communicate with the rest of the body. Here's an actual cross section view with the same things marked. Spinal cord has a narrow central canal that has gray matter around it and it contains sensory and motor nuclei. Sensory nuclei are found dorsally and the motor nuclei are found ventrally. The gray matter is covered by a thick layer of white matter and the white matter, remember, is made up of ascending and descending um, axons that were arranged in columns, we just talked about that, containing axon bundles that have very specific functions. We talked about how some are motor and some are sensory. The spinal cord is very, very organized. So we can predict results of injuries to specific areas. Okay, the anatomy of the spinal nerves. Every spinal cord segment is connected to a pair of specific spinal nerves and the spinal nerves are surrounded by three connective tissue layers that are going to support and also contain blood vessels that will deliver oxygen and nutrients. Dermatomes are bilateral regions of the skin that are controlled by a specific pair of spinal nerves. This is what the dermatomes look like. Um, and oftentimes, if we damage a specific nerve, we know what nerve we damaged, we can understand why a particular part of our body is bothering us. For example, 
if you have damaged nerves in that originate from the sacrum, which would be S3 or S4, then we can often see um, that those nerves, if they are pinched in any way, tend to affect the back of the leg. So if we follow, if we, if we damage S4, we follow that green color, we can see S, S1, S2, here, or let's follow, let's see a little bit closer. Let's follow S2, okay, so we can see that track. So if we, if we uh, bother S2 and that nerve is pinched, then we can trace what part of our body is likely to be affected, the nerve that goes down the back of the leg here. And so it can cause back of leg pain. Or if we hurt the, one of the cervical vertebrae and it affects the cervical nerve, then we can follow the path of that color, so we've got C4 here, so if we harm a nerve at C4, we can see that it will affect the shoulder. So the dermatomes can help us kind of trace if one of our nerves in the vertebral column or that originates out of the vertebral column um, is pinched or pressed on or inflamed, then we can follow the dermatome to see exactly where we are likely to have pain, burning, tingling, numbness, or other nerve problems. Okay, so peripheral neuropathy is a regional loss of sensory or motor function due to trauma or compression. Um, so again, if we compress a nerve, then we are likely to have problems following along the length of that nerve, which can certainly be an issue um, if, again, you've pitched a nerve that carries to the arms and legs, then we can start having numbness and tingling in the arms and legs. You may have heard before of a person saying they've got a pinched nerve and the back of their leg is driving them crazy. If we follow the dermatome, we can see why this is the case. Sensory neurons, there are about 10 million, and they deliver information to the central nervous system. Remember, these are the ones that are carrying sensory information into the CMS to be interpreted. Motor neurons, there are about a half a million, and they are going to deliver commands to the effectors to make an action take place. Interneurons, there are about 20 billion, and these interpret, plan, and coordinate signals in and out. And that wraps up chapter 13, an introduction to the spinal cord.